please welcome Stefan Katsikas. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm different. <laughs> but it was not a joke, actually. <laughs> and my voice is not what it should be, so I will try to go through those 10 minutes, and hopefully it will not be too painful for you and for me. It is true that Nestle is known to be a food and beverage company, more than a pharmaceutical company or a healthcare company. Although we now have in our portfolio Nestle Health Science, which uses nutrition to address complex diseases, and we also have Nestle Skin Health, which is a fully-fledged dermatology company. Now, how did that happen and why? What this shows behind me is the transition from, of the relationship between humanity and food, if you wish. It really started as a search for survival. It then became a matter of security, personal security and safety, national security in many countries. And you see the drift that has now reached the level where, on top of trying to have a balanced nutrition, we also claim that through nutrition we can contribute to perhaps preventing disease. And this is something perhaps that we haven't heard a lot during the last two days. We are dealing with treating complex diseases. If we could do something to slow the progression of the disease, and in some cases to prevent the onset of the disease or to delay it, we would already contribute. And my main message today, which I can share already now, in case the voice disappears completely, is that complex human diseases are likely to require combinatorial approaches. I personally have many doubts, despite the progress of biotechnology, especially during the last 10 years, that we will have the magic bullet that alone will solve those complex issues. So where nutrition can contribute is probably at that very level, combinatorial approaches to try to improve the quality of life. Now, this transition has occurred for Nestle. Nestle may be even one of the companies that has led it. And the result is shown here. We are all over. We are into supermarkets, and from supermarkets into retail, specialty shops, pharmacies, and hospitals now. And one of the things that I've learned, and maybe I've learned it in this very campus, by the way, is that interesting things in science very often happen at interfaces. So one of my personal goals is, of course, to focus in all of these segments so we can deliver what we are supposed to deliver for people and for our shareholders, but at the same time try to find those interfaces, not only inside our portfolio, but beyond, and hopefully uh, meetings like the Brain Forum will facilitate that type of discussion. So you see there why safety is our first priority. We produce and sell 1.3 billion products every day. Now, what this means, in the words of our chairman, Peter, Peter Brabeck, is that we want to be the leading nutrition, health and wellness company. Our products not only have to be safe, but they also have to contribute to this very ambitious graph behind me, Start your life as healthy as nature allows you to do and maintain this health as long as possible. With our portfolio, we cover the entire journey today. We actually start before birth, during pregnancy, and as you may know, we have contributed to some very interesting data on the epigenetic control of metabolic disorders later on in life that are actually related to the food diets of young mothers. We are driven by a few key guidelines. First, do no harm. Be inspired by nature, people out there, and I say people, I don't say consumer, I don't say patients at this stage. People out there want to be fed, want to eat fresh products. I don't know how this is going to be possible with cities that grow beyond 15 million people, take Sao Paulo, New Delhi, Mexico City. So our job is to make sure that we stay close to nature but at the same time, we can feed the majority of the people that need it. Now, if you look at the first two diagrams and the last one, it deals a lot about development and aging, and about brain development and aging. Something else that I learned earlier on, including with George Innocenti, who is now in the room, actually, um, just before joining EPFL, is that there may be commonalities, molecular mechanisms that are shared between development stages of the brain and aging stages of the brain. And I remember when Patrick, Patrick Habisher, 
asked me to speak for the first time in front of the campus here at the PFL, he said, try to find something that looks technologically advanced. <laughs> so I had to make a few phone calls because I had no idea what he meant by that, but I ended up with Andrew Matus. He was at the Friedrich Mission at that time. This is still one of my favorite slides. It is almost 15 years old, and it is the result of the fusion of gr green fluorescent protein with the actin protein at the gene level expressed in primary neurons and visualized through a fluorescence microscope. And what you start seeing is a growth cone. Actin is shown fluorescent, so the growth cone is advancing. It is redistributing cytoskeletal elements. It is redistributing membranes. And as it does grow, it will eventually find a companion to establish a target and make a synapse. On those days, we thought that synapses, each little dot is a synapse, a connection between a neuron and another one. We thought that synapses were immobile. And Andrew's experiments show they are actually living and moving. As a matter of fact, if you learn something today, somewhere in your brain, some of these synapses will have twitched and moved in order to redistribute the connections that we have been hearing about over the last two days. Now, what we know for sure is that a number of macro and micronutrients are necessary for this to happen. First of all, we need energy. We need energy, and for this we need neat lipids and glucose. I know that Pierre Magistret is in the room as well. All my past is catching up with me, actually, today. We also know, we know, we need the building blocks, because the connections are shaped and reshaped. And for this we need proteins and also lipids to do structured pieces of the membrane. And we need micronutrients. Now, when you see something like that, and you have the ambition of contributing to brain health, you start to wonder, but what is it of what we eat that eventually ends up in the brain? Can we actually reverse engineer the process, design molecules that we will eat, that will be metabolized, and that will end up exactly where we want them to be in the brain? Is there actually any evidence that lipids, for example, I will just take very few examples, that some lipids, for example, can contribute to improve brain health. And this is work that has been published and republished since then. This is Chang's group, showing that mid-chain triglycerides have a very impressive impact on children that are epileptic and do not respond to the standard of care, like Valpronat, for example. And this, is, this impact actually was developed into products by a small company based in Liverpool, Vitaflu. And you see, what I like very much is that they designed those products as if you go out and buy them in a shop, because they wanted the children to feel that they were eating normal products like everybody else. Now, these diets make an enormous difference. These children go from six, seven epileptic seizures per day to less than one per week. It is the difference between having a normal life and have no life at all. And uh, the founder, um, Ms. O'Donnell, came to me last year and said, but you know, my dream, as we start a new clinical trial, this company was acquired by Nestle three years ago, my dream as we start a new clinical trial would be to give to those children chocolate. Can you make chocolate for me that tastes good and has mid-chain triglycerides? So what we did, because you cannot refuse anything to that particular lady, is that we stopped one of the lines producing those 1.3 billion products and actually did for her and the children that are going to trials, Kit Kats. And you cannot imagine the pleasure and the joy to be able to provide what is actually very close to being a drug under a format that is playful and that gives the signal to these children that they are like everybody else. So the question I would like to ask to my colleagues from the pharma industry, is it not time to think about combinatorial studies? Where we actually, while we focus on our specific expertise, and you need to focus to be good, so that has to be done, we also try to move out, bridge the gaps, shake hands, sit around the same table, and establish pre-proprietary ventures to try to help the people that need it. Micronutrients. You, you have certainly heard about fortification, especially in the developing world. It is a crucial, essential, unmet need. It's an unmet nutritional need. It is also an unmet medical need. Last year, because we have committed to do so through creating sure value for society, Nestle has actually sold 160 billion 
fortified servings in the world. And there are a number of clinical trials trying to address whether fortification can really be connected with an improvement in quality of life and in health status. And there is this stat study that I like particularly, the Yingyang Bao. It started in 2001 as a collaboration between the government of the Gansu province and Nestle, Nestle China. Then Nestle dropped the study after six years. We had done our job. But the Chinese government followed those children systematically for the last 15 years. And they were able to show that the fortification that we provided, which was a very simple sachet with powder inside, including iron, fought stunting. These children had grown like their peers and also significantly improved the results in school. Since then, we know that if the brain doesn't receive the right amount of iron during a sensitive window between birth and the second year of life, the full capacity of the brain of that particular child will never be accomplishable. So again, macronutriment can contribute, micronutriment can contribute as well. Of course, they are not as powerful as some of the drugs or technologies or electrons and electrodes that we have heard about, but I think they can play a role and we should investigate thoroughly this opportunity. Now, brain and food, and some of my colleagues yesterday mentioned already a few times the gut-brain axis. There is a crosstalk between the gut and the brain. I just gave you two examples. What we now know is that up to 30% of the metabolites that you find in the brain may be of microbe origin. As a matter of fact, we carry more microbial DNA than human DNA. We have trillions of passengers on the skin and in our gastrointestinal tract. So more than a dialogue, this again is going to be a discussion. And Nestle happens for other reasons, by the way, um, through the work done at the Nestle Research Center, to have the world's largest probiote microbes that you can eat collection in the world. Again, and I'm saying this formally today, I would like to push this collection on the table so we join hands and efforts and try to contribute to a better understanding of the relationship between those three sectors of our body. This is a paper published by my colleague at the Nestle Institute of Health Science and the Nestle Research Center, showing actually that the situation is much more complicated than what I said. You see, you may eat fibers, very healthy fibers, when they get into your uh, gastrointestinal tract, they will actually switch the differentiation of some microbes. The new microbes shown in blue, they were red, now they are blue, will actually process nutrients and molecules in a different way. And it will start to generate short chain lipids. Those will be taken up by the enterocyte, the wall of the intestine, and those very enterocytes will start to build glucose. So you eat fibers because you want less glycemic index in your body, and actually your friends and passengers will turn it into glucose. It goes to the brain, and there are retrofit um, um, signals that will actually stimulate neoglucogenesis again. So you see the relationship, in our opinion, between the microbiome, the gastrointestinal tract, and the brain is going to be one of those new frontiers. Every year there is a new frontier, every year there is a biological revolution, and that is the case. It is true. What we have to do is to keep our specificity, be good at what we do, and then bridge the gaps with the others so that we can contribute to the overall quality of life and health of the population. So what we are doing now, I'm, I'm close to be finished. We do have here at the Nestle Institute of Health Science a project to actually genotype all the patients that we take in our nutritional studies. But at the same time, Ed Bege, the director of the Institute, is launching a massive uh, attempt to establish a metabolomic database I personally would like to see the metabolome of all the patients that we have genotype every five years. Birth, five years, 10 years, 15, 20, 25. So we can correlate what happens to the major stages of our life. This is again a very ambitious project. I personally believe that most of it should be pre-proprietary. And that's another of the message that I spread around the world when I travel and I, when I explain to people how Nestle wants to contribute to our quality of life. Here a quote from uh, Ed, you may have heard in the press, it made a lot of noise, he called it Iron Man. Iron Man is this attempt to actually tell each of us what we exactly need 
in order to compensate what is missing at any given time. So again, it's very, it, it's a, I, I find it a very enthusiastic um, statement. Then, of course, what a CTO does is that it contributes to discovery, development, and deployment. And when I see this, I wonder, and I talk to Ed, how ever are we going to make this available to people? We are not going to mix supplement pills every day, in the morning and at night, and we are not going to do a blood sampling every day. So we go back to what we are the best at. We are the best at providing services. What you see here, from babiness, infant formula in a machine, to coffee of various kinds, specialty, we know how to build machines that deliver what you like to drink or eat in the future. And therefore, we establish a collaboration with the Media Labs at MIT, our system center in Orb and the Nestle Institute of Health Science, to build a machine that will be able, if properly instructed, to deliver to you every day the exact complements that you need in order to maintain your homeostasis and health balance as accurately as possible which is what I would call precision medicine. So these are my two, this is my last slide. My two messages are quite simple. Um, complex human diseases will require multiple approaches, possible combinatorial therapies, and nutritional strategies, given the priorities of Nestle, uh, amongst other, can contribute to improve the safety and efficacy, perhaps opening therapeutic windows of highly specific drugs. Thank you very much.